Hello, everyone. Joe Safiger here. Today, I'm doing an interview with Elizabeth Kristoff. She's the owner of Brain Based Wellness and the founder of Neurosomatic Intelligence. Hey, Elizabeth, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. I just kind of wanted to share you with the world as many people can figure out what you're doing, the better off the world will be. (laughs) Thank thank you. Thank you for joining. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how did you find your way into this brain-based world of helping people? Well, I started studying applied neurology um, probably around 2015. I had some movement studios here in Austin, some Pilates studios, and uh, we were developing a national teacher training program. And I, through a wormhole research, found my way to Z Health and started learning applied neurology, mostly for um, athletic performance and pain management, and started weaving that into our Pilates teacher training program. And, you know, most of my life, like up until that point, I I think I looked pretty successful on the outside. Like I was the kind of person who got up at 4 a.m. every morning and did all my things and I journaled and I was sober. Um, But I had a lot of really dysfunctional patterns in my life. I would like work myself into the ground, get shut down with migraine or an episode of binge eating. I had a lot of chronic pain. And in general, I was really dissociated even though I taught mindful movement. And as I started doing applied neurology, that started to change. I started to like really wake up to my own body. I was feeling the consequences of what was happening to me. And that started to disrupt some of the patterns in my life as I became more present in my own body and able to feel the state of my nervous system. And all of that really came to a head in 2018. Um, I, the business started to fail, um, mostly because it was built on like unsustainable practices of running myself into the ground. Um, And I was under a ton of financial stress, started to get really sick. Um, My partner at the time, my romantic partner at the time was diagnosed with a rare cancer around his heart. And I also went into being a full-time caretaker for him. And under that really heavy stress load, a lot of unresolved childhood trauma came back to the surface for me, I think, because the internal state of my body was the same. Um, and I started to really collapse. Like it, it got really, it got really hard. Um, a lot of dissociation, a lot of flashbacks, a lot of really intense pain, um, nausea, sickness, throwing up all the time. And I started moving into my own healing into the world of somatics, into trying to address some of this. And I also had all of this applied neuro background. I'd been continuing my education with Z-Health and I realized how much all of this was outputs of my own nervous system and how much that framework of applied neurology could be really useful in the world of somatics and started weaving the two together. And as I started to do that for myself and then for my clients, that was really where brain-based wellness came from using the framework of applied neurology, but taking it out of the world of athletics and bringing it into trauma resolution, behavior change, and general well-being. As I started to experience that in myself and, and start to really use applied neurology to help resolve my own trauma, my binge eating, my cycles of workaholism, and, and taking it in a different direction then. Do you find people often are curious about what the word somatic is? Yeah, I think I think it's becoming a more recognized world, but that might just be in my little insulated bubble, my social media vortex. Um, it generally, somatic just means body-based of the body, right? And so when we talk about somatic practices in this context, it's really processing stress emotions and past trauma patterns through the body. Like it's this idea that trauma is not the event that happens to us. It's the, it's the consequence of that event (laughs) and the way it gets stored in our body and our nervous system. So trauma lives very much in the present moment when I'm reactivated and my body and my nervous system respond in a certain way, that's the trauma. It's not, not whatever happened. Um, 
And so somatic practices are generally about helping the body to resolve those past incidents and patterns that are held in the body and to be able to express the big emotional energy that's also either suppressed or repressed in the body and to create healing, not just at the level of our cognitive mind, but in the body and in the nervous system. Cool. Thank you. For the people who were like me when I originally came across the word and was like, what is that? <laughs> yeah. And there's all different types of somatic practices, right? There's like EFT tapping, which helps you move emotional energy through. There's somatic breath work, which dysregulates you intentionally in a safe container so that your body can then discharge big emotions. There's somatic therapy that just kind of very gradually coaches you how to come back into your body within your window of tolerance um, and begin to you know, reestablish the relationship with the body and process some stuff through. And that really comes from Peter Levine. There's all different kinds of somatic practices and I've probably tried them all, <laughs> including, yeah, just many, many types of, of somatic experiencing work. Um, and what I really realized in going through that myself and now having worked with, you know, hundreds of clients who have also been on this healing journey is that there is a need for tools, neurosomatic tools that help the nervous system feel safe with these body-based practices, because it can still be really threatening um, at the level of the nervous system and the survival brain to reconnect to the body, to move those emotions through, to bring up what was repressed and start to allow it to express. And there's also a real need for the ability to integrate these experiences into daily life, because we can have these huge discharge experiences where we're releasing all this anger or grief or past stress. And then we still have to go back into our regular life. And sometimes without the tools, without neurosomatic tools or a framework of applied neurology, what will happen is people will either get stuck in that state, like the big expression catapults them back into an emotional flashback or a, a previous part of themselves. And they find that they're now moving through the world um, in a really different internal state, looking through a very different lens, and they can't quite get back out of it to who they know themselves to be. Or they try to integrate the changes, the big awarenesses that have come through the somatic therapy and it's scary to the survival brain and to the nervous system to start to set more boundaries or speak your truth or operate differently in your business. Like these things are very challenging and inside it starts to build up a high level of stress. And then just by pushing through, trying to integrate those awarenesses, we can end up in like burnout, a shutdown state, facing some pretty negative outputs of our nervous system because we aren't working with the nervous system on a daily basis to increase its capacity, to make ourselves more resilient and to, to work to regulate around these new actions and ideas in order to make them safe at the survival level. Makes sense. Um, you talk about disassociation. Um, it, is that, how do you, how, how do people if they're not even aware they're disassociating, right? Like, how do you, how do you find that? Like when you're having a conversation with someone or someone's coming about it, like, do you see where disassociation is something where like a people are just clueless that they're even doing it? Yeah. Most of the time, right? Like if we're in a dissociated state, so first of all, dissociation is, it's not bad. It's not, there's nothing wrong with you. If you dissociate, it's just another protective output of our nervous system doing the best that it can to keep us safe. And something about the situation was too intense. It was too dysregulating. It was too much and it overwhelmed the system. And so your brain's best option was to block the sensory inputs from being able to come up to your cerebral cortex, to your cognitive mind, so that you are no longer present to the sensations of your body or to the sensory inputs coming in from that environment, from that moment, right? And that can often happen in childhood when certain stimulus would really overwhelm the system. And it is really advantageous to not take all of that in. Um, and then our system can become hypersensitive to sensory inputs and even hypersensitive to feeling the signals inside of our own body. And 
and start to move more frequently into that pattern of dissociation when it's not really life-threatening anymore, but that becomes a well-worn path, a well-worn response. And we can end up, you know, cycling into that stress response very easily um, with a, like very minimal triggers can, can bring us there. Anything that reminds our brain of that past experience, which could be like a difficult conversation. It could just be um, a period of high stress at work. It could be feeling the signals inside of your body, like presence itself becomes the threat. And so you start to move into dissociation. And so um, it's it's very normal for that to become a well-worn path. And we're very unaware of it most of the time. because it is a way of, it's it's just deeply repressed. And so to start to recognize it yourself, some some signals that you can look for, and you can start to bring your awareness to is, um, if you find yourself like not remembering how you got somewhere, or um, a lot of feeling a lot of brain fog, finding yourself like unable to articulate what you're thinking or feeling like you just can't get the words out. If you're in a conversation, um, unable to feel any sensations inside of your body. Um, what else would be some signs? Um, often you can see it reflected in behaviors like avoidance or numbing behaviors. So if you're doing something and you just sort of compulsively without thinking about it, pick up your cell phone and start scrolling through Instagram or checking your email or, you know, detaching from the current situation by using a, a a self-soothing or numbing behavior, that's a form of dissociation. So it's, it's on a really big spectrum, right? I think sometimes people think of it as complete detachment from reality. And it's definitely, that is one manifestation of it. You can completely leave your reality, but there's, it's on this huge spectrum and it can be as small as, as being someone who daydreams a lot and leaves to another place, but in this kind of fantasy world, but it looks very normal and, and feels very normal. And, and when you kind of talked about, you know, having that path become something that's easier and frequent, that's the neuroplasticity that you're talking about, right? Yeah. What we do, we get better at, right. It becomes a well-worn pathway and it's efficient and also our survival brain, our back brain. So I'm not talking about the part of our brain that consciously makes a decision. This is way below that. It's in our brain stem. It's reflexive. And you will switch into this mode of being without any conscious awareness. Like that's the thing about trauma responses is that they are reflexive and below the level of consciousness. So you don't have, it's not like you cognitively make a decision. This is too much for me and I'm going to check out. It doesn't, it's like that and it's done. So um, yeah, go ahead. How did how did your awareness to this come about? Like what you know, you you were doing a lot of different aspects of things, right? So do you, do you have like a moment in time where all of a sudden you realize like they're talking about disassociation? I do that. Like anything like that? I would say the very beginning of really seeing a lot of this for myself was reading the book Complex PTSD by Pete Walker. Um, and I was reading it initially, actually to help my partner at the time, my, my partner who had cancer, he also had pretty severe complex PTSD. And, um, I was trying to understand why as a healthy 39 year old who didn't drink or smoke and we ate really clean, like, why did he get cancer and what was going on? And that led me to the work of Nadine Burke Harris and then, uh, Dr. Vincent Folletti who talk about ACE scores and the link between adverse childhood experiences and developing a disease state in your body later on and started to learn like, wow, if you have an ACE score over five or six, maybe you have a truncated life expectancy by 20 years. And I started to look at the ACE scores and realized I have an ACE score of six and as well as like my partner also. Right. And, and I started to understand why I had autoimmune and a whole new world started to open up for me and understanding like how much trauma is at the root of disease and how much nervous system dysregulation is at the root of disease. 
and it's not like and addiction and and all these other behaviors right and so then i started reading all of the books waking the tiger um the body keeps the score trauma and healing and complex ptsd by pete walker and when i read complex ptsd by pete walker I, I saw myself, like I was reading it for my partner and I started to think like, oh, dang, that's me. Um, and, and he describes dissociation in there as well as a bunch of other numbing behaviors. And then that, that launched me into a long road of studying and understanding the neurology of these different responses, understanding the neurology of complex PTSD. And the more I learned intellectually, I started to, because I'm a, I'm definitely like an intellectual bypasser. I will figure everything out logically and never feel it in my body, never feel it emotionally. Um, but I started to understand intellectually, and I could just recognize my behavior, and think back on all of these experiences. You know, when my business partner would be talking to me about the financial situation that we were in with the business, and I would not be able to get my head up off the desk. Like we were having a meeting and I was literally laying with my head on the desk and I couldn't keep my eyes open. And I didn't understand what was happening at the time. Right. And now looking back, I can see like I was, the stress load was too high. I was completely dissociated and I went into a flop state. Um, and so I had to learn about it intellectually, see my experiences mirrored back to me and the things I was reading and then I started to develop the practices to be able to actually feel it in my body and to have that, that knowing when something becomes embodied and internalized, but it took me a really long time to get there. And still sometimes in my embodiment practices or in my somatic practices, I do check out, but now I know when I'm checking out and I know that I'm like exceeding minimum effective dose, this is, it's been a journey. And at that point in time, you kind of like recognize like my brain lost fuel, like I need sugar or I need to do some neuro drills or something now changes for you, correct? Yep. Now I can start like the, the more I practice this and the more I practice it with my clients, because now I can start to recognize too, when someone I'm speaking with is dissociated, right? Like there's a certain look mm. and they're, they lose like, um, facial expression, their vocal tone might change. Um, I can also tell that they're just not present with me. They're not able to like answer back or they start to um, check out of the session. Like oh, suddenly they start talking about something else completely. I got to check. They, they start going through their to-do list with me or something. And I know like I've lost them. We've done too much. Right. And so I, I start to recognize it in my clients. I start to recognize it in myself and I can start to recognize it with much earlier signals before I'm already in that state where I can't stand up, right? Like with my previous experience, sometimes it would get so bad that I would just lay down in the middle of the hallway and pass out. Like I couldn't even make it to the bedroom. Um, now I can catch it long before that and start to do some stuff, use my tools, use my neurosomatic tools to activate certain areas of the brain to upregulate my sympathetic nervous system to come back into my breath into my body in a safe way i can also start to recognize when i'm exceeding minimum effective dose and know like this is too much for me this is i this is it's beyond my body's capacity even though my frontal lobe might think i can handle it my body is telling me no and so I know now when to start pulling back, giving myself stimulus that helps me to come back, speaking the language of the nervous system, speaking in neurological inputs to my nervous system to help it come back. And then as the more I do that, the more I can interrupt that pattern and be able to stay present, be able to stay in my body, not go down the well-worn path of dissociation, then the less and less my brain and my nervous system turn to that output to protect me. It becomes less and less frequent over time. So you've been fairly well in tune with yourself at this for about five years now, right? Yeah, I would say 2018, right. about five years. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, in do you feel like you're just scratching the surface of 
what's what's capable for your neuroplasticity with those well-worn paths that you were referring to or do you feel Definitely. like okay so you, so yeah. like you feel like there's Definitely. you can go so much further in five years oh, is just yeah. like the beginning I mean, yes I feel like also to like you know I like I said I have an A score of six and that just it is what it is but it means that I have to it does mean my nervous system is more sensitive than someone else it's because during my development there was a very high stress load a very high level of dysregulation some pretty severe stuff that had an imprint on me and so I do have to move at a different pace. And that's something that I have to be really honest with myself about. And, and and like, that's been hard for me too. So, but I also am getting better and better at honoring that and allowing it to unfold as it unfolds. And like, I am, I don't know that I'll never, like, will I ever be someone who doesn't dissociate? Will I ever be someone who doesn't have moments of like severe panic and some of these bigger outputs? I, I honestly, I don't know. Um, but they definitely happen fewer and further between, and that continues to improve the more I do this work. And my relationship to those moments is very different. Like I think because of the amount of regulation I do on a daily basis, the the resilience, the bandwidth that I have in my bucket, even when I'm in the response, there is a part of me that can stay connected to my higher order thinking systems. And I do have the ability now to, even as it's happening, recognize what's happening and have some altitude from that moment. And sometimes I do just have to let it play out. You know, I'm going to curl up in the fetal position and scream in an inappropriate moment, you know, um, and not like super, super inappropriate, but, you know, <laughs> in a situation that doesn't warrant that reaction. Right. Um, and I can also observe myself and know what's going on and have compassion for myself and know that it will pass and know that there's another side and sometimes even communicate with other people, like with my partner, I'm having a thing, this is happening. Give me five minutes. And, and then I can use my tools to re-regulate and come back what was it what's that what's that been like uh learning to communicate what you've been experiencing with friends and people around you who are not part of this neural world yeah I mean I live in a little bit of a bubble where most people in my world are part of this world you know like I most of my friends are on a healing journey and um most of them speak the language of the nervous system also, but I will say like my partner does not. Um, he, he, he has done a lot of his own healing work um, in order. I mean, I think that both people in a, in a partnership have to do their own work. Um, and that is, he has done that, but he's not like a neuro person. Um, so it is interesting a safe relationship is a whole new frontier for me as well. So there's been a lot of growth and nervous system regulation around that, but it is interesting to communicate this stuff with him. And, and there are times when like I'm experiencing a reaction, I get triggered even sometimes by like intimacy and connection, right? Even just being really present, someone being really present with me and me being really present with them can send me into a state of panic. And so I have to develop my skills at communicating that. And I will sometimes like say to him, like, I know my reaction right now is completely disproportionate to what's going on. Give me a minute, you know, and, and, and then also being able to talk about the stuff when I'm not in that moment and kind of talk through it and verbalize what's happening for me so that then the next time he has a greater understanding and same for him he can let me know what's you know what did happen for him when something triggered him and and we can talk about that so that we can help each other recognize it but also just know when we need to kind of like just be the anchor for the other person and just stay stay grounded stay regulated ourselves, and allow them to be dysregulated for a little bit okay it's it's just, there's some beauty in that, right? 
it's totally necessary. I think I don't, I don't think we can ever really expect someone to like be in a regulated state all of the time. I don't even think that's the purpose. I don't think that's how we're built. I don't think nervous systems work that way. Um, and it's just like creating safety around the dysregulation as well, where like the relationships and the life that we build allows us to have fluctuation in how we're doing so that we can be we can be okay with that. Like this, so that there's not those moments of shame or shutdown, but there's like release that happens and then a space for re-regulation that is like a safe container. Yeah. Um, so you 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 mentioned that you would be a little bit more intellectual about it, a little more heady. Um, what do you see with clients who would be the the opposite side of that where they're more emotional versus analytical hmm. yeah I mean I I honestly I do not draw a lot of highly Inclusion. emotional people yeah um, I mean it's just not who comes in to my sphere a lot because I think often our clients are mirrors of ourselves, and I think in general we live in a society where like true healthy emotional expression is not taught it's not understood it's uh, emotions are by and large we're taught to suppress our emotions or even more strongly than that to repress them because it's very dangerous and threatening to our survival at a young age to really be able to express right so i i do get people that come in in a state of dysregulation that have a lot of emotional reactivity but i think that is very different than being able to actually express and process your emotions, like being stuck in emotional flashback or having a highly reactive nervous system that is cycling through fight, flight, freeze and fawn and having like outbursts of anger in inappropriate spaces and, and all of that, that is not the same as developing a practice of being able to feel, express, be present for the spectrum of emotions of your life to really be able to honor and sit with your grief and allow it to move through your body somatically to connect with your anger to feel the power of it to move it through you to practice somatic practices of release and then when we really have those skills of of allowing our body to do what it's supposed to do with emotions and the regulation and resilience in our nervous system to be able to stay present with those emotions and not repress or suppress them, then we, it actually does not look like emotional reactivity in life because you are processing and moving the emotions through and you're developing a really healthy way of doing that so that now my anger doesn't erupt inappropriately on someone that I don't mean to take it out on. Um, I'm not like weepy and out of control and in, in situations where I don't want that. Like it's, um, it's, it's just very different emotional reactivity versus, um, emotional intelligence. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, you mentioned uh, for yourself binge eating as well. So then I got to, I imagine the other side of it is true as well. If you're just avoiding, if you're purging, right? Like then that's, you're just using food in a different manner, but it's, it's another symptom, right? Oh yeah. It's all the same thing. Um, I mean, there's so many different flavors I was thinking, of I was thinking disordered like, eating. Yeah, I was thinking like, what are what are more of the symptoms besides, you know, food, disassociation? Like, what else do you think of that people might recognize in themselves or their own patterns where they're like, oh, this work would really help me? <laughs> everything we experience is an output of our nervous system, right? So like literally everything that you think, feel, say, do, experience, is a result of your brain and nervous system function. So if you start to look at your life in that way, all of your outputs are your brain and your nervous system's best bet at getting either the fuel and the activation that it needs to stay healthy, activated, alive, functioning well, or to regulate. And so 
uh, I mean, I could talk about food forever. Like food is a really, it's actually a really complex subject. There's a lot of layers to it. First one though, is starting with like, we use food as a tool for, for self-regulation. So if I am in a highly dysregulated state, if I'm stuck in a high stress state for a long time, my brain and my nervous system understand at a deep level that like I'm talking about my survival brain, that that is dangerous, that that is life-threatening because remember high levels of stress for a long period of time lead to disease state. And stress is at the root of 75 to 90% of all the major diseases, heart disease, cancer, autoimmune. And, and we have this divine and intelligent system that understands like, I cannot stay stuck in this state. And one of the best ways to come down into a calm and respond, rest and digest state is to eat a bunch of food. It will upregulate my vagus nerve. It will allow me to start to feel signals from inside of my body again. If I have interceptive deficits, it will shut me down. And throughout most of my life, I would push past pain. I would push past a migraine. I would push past exhaustion. I trained as an athlete. I was a workaholic. But if I had a binge, I would go lay down in bed. I would pull the covers over my head and I would sleep and my system would get a little pause from that high level of stress all of the time. And I truly believe that my binge eating is what kept me from getting really, really sick at an earlier age. Um, I, I, I think it was my system's intelligent way of knowing like this will give us the rest that we need. And there wasn't, I, I was too afraid of rest. It was too scary, too threatening, not possible any other way at that time. Um, and so, and then there's lots of other layers underneath that, right? There's the emotional suppression, repression component of it. There's subconscious beliefs. There's not feeling safe in a body in a certain way. So there's layers and layers on the food stuff very deep relationship to our body and food. Um, but lots of other outputs. I mean, panic is an output of the nervous system. Depression is an output of the nervous system. Chronic pain is an output of the nervous system. Uh, being driven to work all the time is an output of the nervous system. Overtraining is an output of the nervous system. Emotional reactivity, like we talked about. I mean, there's so, it's everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really been interesting in this neural world of kind of discovering that whether it's the physical or the emotional or the mindset you know the neurology of storytelling and all of those things how it just kind of seems to be everything as you put it <laughs> yeah i mean there's like i said like there are layers and layers on healing and it keeps expanding and unfolding like you ask about and at the foundation of all of it is the health and resilience of my nervous system right? So like, I cannot address all the other things. I can't be present with the emotions. I can't process them. I can't cognitively start to change my mindset and my beliefs and, and that framework. If I'm stuck in a state of dysregulation, it, for, that has to come first, like do all of the healing things, but also have a practice of working with your nervous system so that the other things are possible and not just initially, but in a sustained way. Like I really can't keep progressing in my healing if if I have all of these unresolved deficits in my nervous system and I'm not breathing well and I can't feel in my body because my interceptive system has all of these deficits and there are sensory mismatch issues going on that keep my nervous system stressed out all of the time. Like these things have to be healed at least in conjunction with these other practices or else it's just not really possible. Yeah. That's a, that can be like a lot and heavy for people who, you know, may be feeling some of these things too. Um, you have such a terrific program where you allow people to come into your membership and, and work with them. So, you know, for anyone who's listening right now, who might be interested in working with Elizabeth or understanding this stuff more, you know, we'll put a, a link in below to kind of go to her membership. Um, you give people two weeks to like try it for free and make sure it's right for them. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I know it, it can feel overwhelming. Right. And it's this whole other component of ourselves that we don't know anything about a lot of times. Like we all have this 
really intelligent operating system and we're just not taught anything about it and we don't know how to work with it. And the beautiful thing about this is that we are always changing all of the time. Like that's neuroplasticity. Um, that's the rule that we are never, we never stop adapting to the stimulus that's coming in understanding how your operating system works starts to give you some agency over what way you're changing in, right? Like if you can start to understand how to work with the nervous system, how to start to change those sensory inputs, you can drive the change in a positive direction because you're going to be changing no matter what. And you, by, by knowing how it works, you can start to make those changes changes that you want in your life. And so it's, it is possible to create that change and it doesn't have to be big at first. Like on the site, we start with three minutes a day, minimum effective dose, morning practice of giving your nervous system some positive stimulus that it likes. And really, even once you get further down the road in the practice, it's really, we're talking about like 10 minutes a day, maybe, maybe 20 spread throughout the day. But this isn't like changing your whole life or taking on this huge new project it little by little we get there and we add it up at the at the capacity that your nervous system can handle yeah it's so cool how like 10 seconds of a drill can just make a huge difference like in the moment just knowing like you know for me if I stick my tongue into my right cheek like I know that's that's good for me and, and if I'm playing pool or if I'm playing pickleball lately like I've been noticing like oh this will give me a little boost and then I feel more in flow when I do it um yep yeah I mean I have clients that like for a long time they just pick like three or four different things that make their nervous system feel good. And they do them a lot and they do them when they're in stressful situations. And they're like, I did my tongue circles. And I'm like, great. At some point, we're going to need to do something besides tongue circles. But you know, that works for a while. And then eventually they get to the place where they're like, oh, I'm ready to start like actually training my nervous system now to start to heal my deficits. And before they've just been using the neurosomatic tools for like rescue tools, like they just rescue themselves over and over again when they're in dysregulation. And you know what? That's fine because again, what we do, we get better at. And if they're getting better and better at interrupting those moments of dysregulation and coming out of that high stress state, that is creating change in the nervous system. They're going to start to feel that way less and less and less when they interrupt that pattern more and more and more. And so great, they're doing that. And then over time, they start to have the capacity to maybe start to train their visual system or train their balance system or start working on their body mapping. And when the time is right, the time is right, you know, and then they can get there and then the changes become, um, a little bit like faster and, and, and bigger. And you can start to see evidence of it in your life more like, wow, I'm really responding differently to things that used to, send me into a spiral. Like it doesn't have that same effect on me anymore. Wow. My pain is really changed or wow. My athletic performance is really different in the beginning. It, it isn't always there, right? Like that, you know, we start slowly, but then the more you work to heal your nerve, nervous system, the more capacity you have for more stimulus. So you can add more and more. And then that change happens faster and bigger, the longer you stay with it. Yeah, that's what makes neuroplasticity so cool. Right? Yeah. It's it's like the it's the hope. It's the hey, this this can get better. This is this is going to be this can be amazing. I'm not stuck where I am. Um no. and the other, you know, I know this is Monday that we're shooting this and I know on on Wednesday is the closing for your your next practitioner training, but for any coaches or therapists or medical professionals like to me the more I've learned about the nervous system, the more I see that if you're not working with a coach or a therapist or a trainer or your doctor isn't knowing what's going on with your nervous system, then sooner than later, people are going to just be walking away from those people because they're going to need to work with somebody who understands that my individual nervous system is different than everybody else's who walks into their office. Um, so thank you for bringing this work to the world. And if anybody is interested in that, that's neurosomaticintelligence.com. Yep. Yeah. Well, Neurosomaticintelligence.com. And yeah, we really wanted, you know, as after I brought this work to individuals for a while through brain-based wellness, I just saw such a need for it for practitioners because people would come to me 
people didn't mean to do this, but they just didn't have an understanding of how the nervous system worked. And they would be quite traumatized from their therapy, from their somatic therapy, from their somatic experiences, from their cognitive therapy or their CBT. And it, and they were experiencing really severe outputs of their nervous system, like chronic pain or fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue. And it had gotten worse as they had gone down this journey of trying to heal. And and I, I had seen that happen with myself too, right? Like I would go to somatic therapy and afterwards I would get a rash all over my body. My joints would swell up. Like uh, my body was saying like, you need neuro work in conjunction with this to not experience these outputs. And so I started to weave that in, but I think that and I've seen it happen with coaching programs too, right? Where people are pushing people like take new big, bold action, just go out there and do all of the things, but they're really creating a very high stress state for people, especially if they have um, a, a trauma history. And, and sometimes the outputs can be really severe. And so these tools give practitioners and coaches and therapists um, an applied neurology framework and practical, actionable tools that you can easily integrate into your practice, into your coaching program, whether it's a group coaching program or with individuals to start to really help people make all of the great work that you're doing with them safe at the level of their nervous system, safe in their body, um, in a way that you don't have them experiencing these big outputs, because just like you said, eventually the people are going to say enough, like, I can't do this anymore. It's too much. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I'm not getting the results that I want. I keep taking the action, but then I keep backsliding into avoidance, procrastination, numbing behaviors, or worse, I get sick, I get pain, I can get shut down. And so when you have these tools, it allows the people that you work with to be able to implement all of the work that you're doing with them and not be compromising their, their safety at the level of their survival mind, at the level of their nervous system and not sacrificing their health so that they can keep going and keep doing the work and, and really get to the place that, that you want them to get to. So we are, we're an ICF accredited course. Um, and we are also licensed for physical therapy CCEs in a couple of states. And um, it's a really, it's a really wonderful course. It's with Matt Bush of Next Level Neuro, Melanie Weller of Fearless Presence. And she's also a licensed physical therapist and a Vegas nerve expert and me. And it's very hands-on, very high touch. You get us live. We have a WhatsApp thread where we're communicating with people all of the time, answering their questions in real time. Um, we have coaching calls and um, bonus lectures and all kinds of great stuff. It's a really tight knit community and it's a really, really neat experience. Yeah, it's it's been a super cool community to be introduced to. Uh, all the people are awesome. Um, the and practitioners that are in the community are honestly part of the best part of it. You know, it's really forward thinking, growth oriented people, very supportive of each other. And it's so cool to see how people are taking these neuro tools and applying them to so many different aspects of work, whether it's like with relationships for non-monogamous couples or um, addiction therapists or plant medicine facilitators or people who work with children, families. I mean, it's just all over and it's, it's been really wild and fascinating to see. Yeah. I loved one of uh, CJ's TikTok videos of, you know, pretending with the being a dinosaur, right? Like how to, how to bring the neuro tools into playing with children. And I was like, that's so cool. It's so cool. CJ Smith is brilliant. If you don't already follow her on TikTok and Instagram. Her neuro videos are, mwah, they're so good. Yeah. And then uh, for anybody else, you know, the, the other thing that I want to share with people is your, the podcast that you're part of Trauma Rewired um, is yes. another great resource where people can go, you know, you've got part one, part two of NSI, you talk about complex PTSD in depth in multiple episodes. Um, what else, what else is on there? So Trauma Rewired is really like, that's my baby. Um, Jennifer Wallace and I do that podcast together. And uh, we just take a very deep 
dive into looking at the neurology of complex PTSD, of, of trauma in general, of emotional expression, of somatic work. And um, we put a lot of time and energy into researching and experiencing and, and living this work and bringing all of that into the podcast. And um, it's really just my hope that this the, these episodes. So we have episodes that break down complex PTSD. We have episodes that break down the four F's, um, fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Um, lots of episodes, really, really cool episodes with Matt Bush on emotional expression. And I just really hope that it is part of the conversation that of a like larger collective awakening that I think is happening now about understanding the role of trauma in our health, in our ability to be present in, in the world and the collective healing and the collective expansion that's coming from that. Um, it's just a conversation that I love to be part of and that I hope other people find themselves in and that it gives them not just a better understanding of themselves, but also self-compassion and hope, like you were talking about, like that, that hope that um, that we are always changing and a deeper understanding of what's going on so that they can start to build a toolkit and practices to create change in an intentional direction. Beautiful. Thank you so much for uh, taking some time today to uh, have this conversation with me, Elizabeth. I appreciate yeah, it. Thank you for having me. Is there any place that you would like people to follow you on social media or website links or anything that you'd like to share that Besides the link, yeah, I think the best place to get started is through the website with the two free week trial. Um, you know, I'm on there live three times a week working with people on their nervous system. You can stay and ask me questions. There's also free video series there that'll teach you a lot of the important basic concepts of neurosomatic intelligence work. And so the website is brainbased wellness.com. And if you go to brainbased wellness.com slash membership, you can get your two free weeks and I'm sure you'll put the link to that in the show notes too. For sure. For sure. All right. Well, uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you.